Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number eight in this unit we are calling Pure Joy. It's a study of the book of Philippians. It's been an awesome study so far. I'm really enjoying this. I hope you are too. Uh, there is a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found the video. Just scroll down, click on that link, download that listening guide. There are some blanks to fill in throughout the lesson, but there are also, more importantly, some uh, questions, some interactive questions for you to cover with your small group. And let me just stop and say, I don't say this enough, let me stop and say, I really hope you are finding a small group to plug into and to do these lessons with. There's something very powerful about bringing together the friendships that happen around the Word of God and the Word of God itself and then speaking these truths into one another's lives. That's where real change takes place. So I do hope that you are finding either on Zoom or in person or one way or another a group, a small group to have these discussions with. Uh, you also are going to need your Bible open to Philippians chapter 2 or your Bible app. We're going to be beginning in verse 19. Before we do the study, though, let's jump into a prayer, shall we? We want so much, Father, uh, to understand the joy that you have in mind for us. We confess to you that uh, living in this lost and broken world makes that difficult. It makes it confusing for us. Um, and we, we have come to understand already, Father, that the joy that you want for us is a very different thing than the more shallow happiness that our secular world pursues. Uh, this joy that you have for us is not tied to our circumstances, Father. Uh, rather, it's tied to something much deeper and much longer than that. And so our desire is to understand it more and more. And so as we open your word today, will you open our hearts Will you pour into them, open our minds, help us to understand. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So it's been a great study, hasn't it? We, we started in chapter 1 uh, with lessons uh, on joy in community with others, on joy in a clear sense of mission. Uh, we had a, a lesson uh, on the Christ follower's ability to find joy even in life or death circumstances. Paul's understanding that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Um, uh, we, we understand uh, in, from chapter 1 also that there can even be joy in opposition, in experiencing opposition from our culture, but standing arm in arm together and, and experiencing that opposition can produce a kind of joy in us. And then we move to chapter 2, and in chapter 2, uh, Paul takes a turn towards um, uh, relationships with one another. And so there were, the, the first lesson came in, in uh, there's a joy in our preserving the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the, the role that we have to play in preserving unity in the church. And, and central to that role, uh, the next lesson would show us, is humility. And so we had a great lesson in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 2 on this beautiful example of Jesus' humility, and we should have the same mind in us, the same attitude as He had. Uh, the, the joy in humble servitude was that lesson. And then lastly, last week we had a lesson on the joy of working out our salvation, Paul's understanding of, of what happens as a result of our salvation. And when he talks about working out our salvation, that's not a salvation by works. That is rather a works as a result of salvation. And so as a result of my, my being saved, there are things that I should be doing, and they have a lot to do with you. They have a lot to do with one another. And so working out our salvation. And then from there he moves into an idea today that, uh, that I, I'm going to use the term interdependence, a joy that can only be found in Christian interdependence. Now let's stop here and recognize that uh, the whole idea of interdependence is very countercultural, at least to the American culture, maybe to the Western culture, because the American dream is all about independence. And I don't mean that in terms of freedom and independence and liberties that we have in our governing documents. I mean the American dream really is about becoming independently wealthy, becoming independent so that I don't need anything from anybody. I'm, I, I don't need anybody to give me anything or to do anything for me. I can stand on my own. Um, there, there is still very, much a, a part, still very much a part of the American fabric, I think, in our secular culture. But, but hear me when I say that the Apostle Paul 
uh, uh, teaches a, a way of being in Christian community that is not about independence at all. In, in fact, the, the more we grow in Christ, the more we realize we should be interdependent on one another. And so in the lesson that Paul has for the Philippian church today, in the, in the portion of his letter today, beginning in verse 19 in chapter 2, he's going to talk about that interdependence, and he's going to use two illustrations, two uh, men who were on his ministry team, who were a part of the Paul Evangelistic Association. Uh, he's going to talk about two of his partners in ministry and how his interdependence on them and them with him brings great joy to his life. So with that idea in mind, let's jump into the scripture beginning in verse 19 of the Philippians chapter 2. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. When Paul says they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, he's talking about other people in ministry. But Timothy's not like that. And so who is Timothy? Well, Timothy is a young man who Paul met on his first missionary journey. When Paul uh, was on his first missionary journey going through two little towns called Lystra and Derbe, uh, uh, Timothy was probably at that point a teenager who Paul met on that journey and who came to the Lord as a result of Paul's ministry in that time. Now, we also know about Timothy that he had a Hebrew mother, but he had a non-believing father, and so he grew up kind of in this hybrid, mixed household of faith. Um, and on Paul's second missionary journey, he actually picked Timothy up and took him with him, and Timothy became a, part, a ministry partner to Paul. They had a very good, very, very um, uh, mentor-mentee relationship. In fact, I would say that their relationship is almost the quintessential mentor-mentee relationship. It is one that discipleship materials um, ever since have pointed to to try to create that kind of a relationship between uh, someone who's teaching and someone who's learning. They, Paul, Paul being the teacher, um, Timothy being the student, and he, he learned. That we're about to find out that he also, it also became so close it was almost very much like a father-son relationship. We have letters that Paul wrote to Timothy when Timothy was serving as a pastor, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, in our New Testament that, that show even deeper uh, love, respect, uh, reverence between the two of them and the relationship that they shared with one another. So when Paul starts talking here about sending Timothy, that's the Timothy that he's talking about. But look what he says. He says, so that I may be cheered. What does he mean? I'm going to send Timothy to you so that I may be cheered. Uh, my wife, Cappy, and I were talking about this week. Um, it feels very parental to, to, to us. It's very much like when you know that your children or your grandchildren are somewhere and they're having an amazing experience, you just want to experience that with them. So you call them and you say, send us pictures, post some pictures on Facebook, send us a video. We want to experience this with you. We, we feel like we're missing out on this. We want to be there with you. We love you that much. That's what I'm hearing from Paul when he says, I'm going to send Timothy there so that Timothy can come back and help me experience what you, what's going on with you. I just want to know what's happening in your lives. And Timothy's going to become my videographer, my journalist, so to speak, who's going to tell me those stories because I can't come right now. And so I love that, that he wants to be cheered up that way. Uh, and then he, he remarks that Timothy is one who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Uh, this, is, this is that same theme from the Apostle Paul about becoming other-oriented, becoming oriented towards other people so that, so that you place their interests ahead of your own. That's so much what, what Christian community and what ministry is supposed to be about. And, and Paul is saying, Timothy got that better than anybody. He understands that better than anybody. He just wants what Jesus wants, not only for him, but for you. He has your best interests at heart. And so I want to send him to you so that you can experience that in him. Uh, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think what Paul is, is highlighting here is that there, 
There are some people who are involved in ministry who are willing to, to pour out lots of time and energy and resources on, on a person or on a group of people from whom they have something to gain, for, from whom they can get something back. And it's clear to them what they want from them, and so they minister to them. That's not being other-oriented. That's being self-centered. And what Paul is saying is Timothy's nothing like that. Timothy, Timothy will be completely put your interests at heart. If you have your listening guide, let's fill the first blank in on your listening guide about this aspect of finding joy and in interdependence. What is Paul saying? Being a friend who builds genuine joy into someone's life is about putting their interests first. That's your blanks to fill in. Their interests first. Even above your own. In this age of digital friendships that steal our joy rather than build it, such selflessness is a rare commodity. And isn't that the truth? In this digital age of social media, we've got friends on Facebook, we've got followers on Twitter, we've got people who are digitally connected to us because there's something that they, they like about us or something they want to hear from us. But are they really genuine Christian friends on whom we can rely, on who, with whom we can be interdependent? That's a different question altogether. That kind of selflessness of putting others' interests ahead of my own is rare, I think, in our culture today. But keep reading. He continues on with Timothy, uh, talking about Timothy in verse 22. He says, But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Let's pick up that last phrase first. I trust in the Lord. It's the same thing he said in verse 19. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon. And I trust in the Lord that I will follow shortly. Uh, this is Paul's uh, way, the, the phrase he uses for saying God willing. If, if it is the will of God, this is what will happen. Um, you may know people in your life who would say, if God wills, if God wills, then yes. Um, uh, James talks about that, the, the brother, uh, half brother of Jesus, or the brother of Jesus talks about, um, uh, uh, don't, talk, don't be one of those kinds of people who says, we will go to this town and we will go here and we will do this and we will do that. Rather, you should say, if the Lord wills. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, in, I hope in the Lord, I trust in the Lord, according to the will of God. That's what I'm hoping for. But he continues to talk about Timothy. He refers to him as a son. He, he refers to Timothy as a son. And what that begins to highlight for us is, this is going to be a sacrifice on Paul's part to send Timothy. So he's going to lose something important in his own life in order to send Timothy to them. And, and I think that, that we don't want to miss that sacrifice, and he's not wanting the, the Philippian church to miss that either. This is a, a not-so-veiled hearkening back to the notion of God sending his only son for our salvation, the sacrifice, the love, the act of love that that is. And I think that Paul is saying, this is an act of love on my part. I'm sending my very son uh, he's like a son to me, to you guys. Uh, his beloved Timothy, sending his beloved Timothy to minister to his beloved church. It's like dear, desperately wanting two best friends to come together uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Paul wanted, make no mistake about this, Paul wanted to do this himself. But he was going to have to send Timothy because he couldn't get out of prison to come and do this himself. So he had learned to depend on Timothy. Timothy was someone... Uh, with whom Paul had become interdependent. And what he's saying here is there is a, a certain joy in that kind of interdependence. And it runs contrary, doesn't it, to our own culture, our own culture of independence, of becoming independent, of being self-reliant. So if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next blank on your listening guide. In the midst of a culture addicted to independence or self-reliance, Christ followers must learn the deep joy of growing increasingly interdependent on one another, on each other, excuse me. Growing increasingly interdependent on each other. It is a kingdom principle that we would learn to truly trust, and trust in and rely upon other people in our lives rather than 
standing all by ourselves as a Lone Ranger Christian. That's not the way Christianity was intended. But then Paul turns and begins to talk about a second team member, Epaphroditus. Uh, Epaphroditus is apparently someone who grew up in the region where Philippi was and is from that church, or at least from that region. And so we're going to see that as he begins to talk about Epaphroditus in verse 25. Here's what he says. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So he's sending Epaphroditus home, um, and, uh, and, and, and I want you to look at the descriptors that Paul uses uh, to talk about Epaphroditus, who had, who had gone through this serious illness. And we, by the way, we don't know what the serious illness was. All we know is that he got it as a result of making this journey. And so uh, he very much put his life on the line in order to complete this mission. Uh, we don't know what the illness was, but we know that the, the Philippian church had probably heard about the illness by this time, and so they were probably concerned about their own brother Epaphroditus, and that's what Paul is setting up here. But look at the descriptors that Paul uses when he talks about Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. Okay, all three of those descriptors have to do with Epaphroditus' relationship with Paul. This is who Epaphroditus is to me my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier in this spiritual warfare that we're fighting. But look at who he is to the Philippian church. And your messenger and minister to my need. He's the person that God used for you to be able to send me a message and a gift and minister to me. So he's more a messenger or an emissary, so to speak, or a carrier of a gift or a minister to Paul on behalf of the Philippian church. And so he played a different role in each of these relationships. And I think that's an important aspect of how interdependence works. The kind of interdependence in, in, that we're called to in following Christ is there are going to be some relationships where we play this kind of role, and there are going to be other relationships where we have a very different role. Sometimes we may be the mentor, sometimes we may be the mentee. Uh, sometimes uh, we may be the one ministering to and pouring into, but in other relationships, there, we may be the ones receiving and, and having something poured into us. Um, we, 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 we get comfortable, I think, in our area of giftedness, and we, we fool ourselves into thinking that all of my friendships, this is going to be my role in that friendship. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's not really the way Christian interdependence works. We have different roles to play in different relationships. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next blank on your listening guide. Sometimes we are the teacher, sometimes the student, sometimes the influencer, and sometimes the one influenced. Part of the joy we get from Christian community is the variety of roles, those are your blanks, the variety of roles we are called upon to play in each other's lives. And I think we need to get okay with that. We need to, we need to be okay with the fact that we're going to play different roles in different lives. Some relationships are going to have more boundaries in them for us than other relationships. Some relationships are going to be more long-term, others are more short-term. They're going to be a variety of different friendships and roles to play in each of those relationships. That's what interdependence looks like. So the last thing that Paul has to say then in beginning in verse 28, let's see what he says. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Stop there, I think less anxious because this man who, who risked his life and got close to death as a result of it just to come minister to me, I want to get him back to you where he belongs. I want him back home so that I will not be worrying about his health. Uh, he will be there at home where he needs to be. Less anxious, in other words, for Paul. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. 
What does that last phrase mean, to complete what was lacking in your service to me? Is that, is that Paul complaining that their ministry to him was somehow lacking and, and fell short? No, it's not that at all. I think, I think this loses something in the English translation. Uh, I think what this is really saying is uh, that, that they had a, a grand plan for how to minister to Paul, the Philippian church, and that Epaphroditus got the privilege of getting to be the final piece in that plan. He got to be the final bridge to, from the Philippian church to Paul to put it all together and make it all come to fruition, the ministry that they had in mind for him. So th this is not Paul complaining or accusing them of lacking. This is really Paul saying Epaphroditus is the guy who, who had the privilege of putting the last piece in the puzzle. What a joy and what a privilege that is. He stood in the gap in order to make this last piece happen. Also note that in Epaphroditus' case, Paul isn't praising him for any particular kind of skill set or giftedness of anything. It wasn't about, oh, Epaphroditus was the perfect person to come and do the job that you sent him to do because of his abilities to do this and his gifted, giftedness for this and his willingness to do this. No, it wasn't about a gift package or a skill set. Sometimes it is in interdependence, but in this case it wasn't. Look at what it was. In this case, Paul found what Paul found extraordinary about Epaphroditus was his dedication to Jesus. It was his complete surrender to Christ. He was willing to risk his life. He nearly died for the work of Christ. It was a complete surrender, including his own life if necessary, in order to fulfill the will of Jesus in his life and in Paul's life. That complete surrender is such a critical aspect uh, on everyone's part in terms of Christian community. So, so as I'm thinking about the joy that comes from interdependence, I have to believe, number one, I am constantly letting go and surrendering more and more of my life to Jesus, but I'm learning to rely on and trust in other people who are doing the same thing. They're completely surrendering to Christ. Um, there is a, a particular joy that can only come from that kind of jointly surrendering. I'm, I'm surrendering to Jesus in me so that I can then lean into the Christ I find in you. And that's what Paul is saying about Epaphroditus. Uh, he found this joy in Epaphroditus, and he wanted the church in Philippi to find it as well. When Epaphroditus got back there, they, he wanted to make sure the church received him this same way. Don't just look for Epaphroditus. Look for the Jesus in him and, and see how much he has surrendered to the work of Christ, to the call of Christ on his life. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last blank on your listening guide now. There is a certain joy we can find, never fully know. There is a certain joy we can never fully know unless and until we are completely surrendered to Christ and are living lives of interdependence with others who are likewise completely surrendered to Christ. Surrender is so much a part of the interdependence that God has in mind for us. And so we see in this lesson that that there is an element of joy that can only come not from the independence that our culture touts, but rather from the interdependence that happens best in Christian community when the Jesus in me and the Jesus in you connect and we learn to actually rely upon one another and live lives that are intertwined with one another and interdependent upon one another. That's another aspect of the joy that the Apostle Paul wants us to experience. Aren't these lessons amazing? I'm loving these. We're going to be in chapter 3 next week, so I hope you'll come back and join me here again next week. In the meantime, I hope your week is amazing. God bless you and yours. God's richest blessings upon you. hope you guys have a great week.